Are you currently looking for a bookstore that has a great selection of books? Well, Kizzy's Books and More is that bookstore. Visit www.kizzysbooksandmore.com to purchase your next book for our book club. Use coupon code VULGARGENIUS to receive 10% off the subtotal of your first order. Jonathan Escoffrey's stellar debut, If I Survive You, takes the short story genre and turns it on its axis to show the multidimensional underbelly of racism, generational discord, and the toll that a series of bad luck takes on the family dynamic. Escoffrey presents a family that has migrated to South Florida to forego political unrest in Jamaica and to make a life in the land of possibility. The story begins with its center on the youngest American-born child, Trelawney. He has found himself homeless and attempts to find financial freedom by taking unusual jobs on Craigslist. Jonathan Escoffrey joins us on the podcast to talk about his personal experiences living in Miami and why readers must allow for space or imagination to thrive within a story. Stay with us for another episode of the Vulgar Geniuses podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Vulgar Geniuses podcast. We're your hosts. My name is Denny. And I am Veronica. And today we are, we're joined uh, with uh, a debut writer who I think everyone should go out and buy his book if you have yet to do so. Um, It is brilliant. And we are so lucky to have him on the show with us today. His name is Jonathan Escafri. Uh, He is the author of the Link Story Collection, If I Survive you a new york times editor's choice and an indie national bestseller if i survive you was long listed for the national book award and the andrew carnegie medal for excellence and is a finalist for the southern book prize the collection has been named a best book of 2022 by the new yorker the new york times npr time and elsewhere Jonathan is a Stegner Fellow at Stanford University. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. So I'm going to pass it off to Denny. We're going to loosen up these interview bones. I know you've been talking to all of the people nonstop since your book came out. So we're, we're just going to loosen up before we get into diving into your book. Sounds good? That sounds great. All righty. Uh, so, hi, Jonathan. Um, where is where is home for you? Like, what do you consider home? Uh, well, I live in Oakland, and I, I understand that that's not the question you're asking. Mm-hmm. Um, home for me might be Southern California. That's uh, like Long Beach, California. That's where I was living before I moved up to Oakland to do the Stegner Fellowship. Um, my partner's down in Long Beach. Long Beach uh, kind of has my heart in a number of different ways. It's the first place I lived in California when I um, moved out here in 2019. And I felt like newly free from just a lot of different things <laughs> from a from a really weird job that I uh, where I, I worked and I lived helping to run a retreat. And it was it was like very difficult to actually leave the premises, the pr- premises <laughs> of the job. <laughs> Um, and I felt like uh, like a new man in a new town that I really loved. And then, unfortunately, I, I, I'm someone who's been chasing fellowships. So I, I decided to do the, the Stegner for some reason. And uh, I, I can't wait to, to get back down there. How long will you be in, in that part of California for your fellowship? Uh, well, up here in Oakland, I'll be here till my lease runs out in August. And the uh, fellowship runs out a couple months before that in June. So waiting on those, uh, those dates and, <laughs> and I'll go be where I want to be. Um, what is the biggest conception that people have about Miami? Did, did you say the, the biggest conception or misconception? <laughs> misconception. I mean, you could answer both. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of things that people believe about Miami are are true it's just like anytime you try to narrow it down to one thing that's where people get into trouble so um yes we do have south beach filled with rich beautiful people um lots of fancy cars all that but you know south beach is like 
three streets deep and like 20 blocks. <laughs> There's a lot more Miami than that. You know what I mean? Um, and even the people who, who work on the beach, I've been one of those people who worked on the beach. It's like we, our jobs, even if they're tied to entertainment and tourism and partying and, and all that fun stuff, um, we still, we still have to live and like, we still have our, our problems and we still, even if it might be that the case that like our, our livelihoods are paid to other people's, like mm -hmm. our, our, our livelihoods are attached to other people's good times. It's like, we're not always having a good time mm -hmm. making your good time yeah. <laughs> happen. So uh, I don't know. Those are some things to, I think, that could stand to be clarified about Miami. And then, you know, Miami-Dade County, it's, it's sprawling. Every neighborhood has its own vibe and subculture in a, in a way. And um, the town I grew up in, I grew up in a couple, but the, the town I lived um, primarily was called Cutler Ridge. And it got kind of renamed as Cutler Bay. And it's a bit shinier than these days than when I grew up um in ways good and bad and um it used to be a one horse town and now they've got like 12 year olds riding around in golf carts with big mm -hmm. trump flags and, um but a lot more like pretty palm trees if you want to look on the bright side <laughs> speaking of odd jobs what was what what was the oddest job you've you've had um I think anytime you you work in somebody's home is is kind of a an odd situation. Um, I think I don't know. Whenever people ask me this, I'm like, all right, that one's illegal. That one's illegal. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> don't incriminate yourself on camera. So, <laughs> and I've yet well, to We're, we're not going to do that to you. We won't tell nobody. <laughs> but I always pause because I'm always like that. that <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah, I mean, and then there's like the other jobs where it's like, uh, I don't want to get people in trouble, but um, yeah, working in people's ho houses. Uh, I had this job that was kind of cool. It was weird where I, I picked up a job I found on Craigslist where um, I, uh, the, the call was for a physical therapist and I have no training in physical therapy. I don't have a license <laughs> as a physical therapist. But it said that was okay. Like it said that, like I, I wasn't like trying to trick, you know, <laughs> trick, trick people because that would be wrong. That would be terrible. <laughs> but yeah. the, um, it, it was working in um, the home of a man who he, he'd been a uh, gymnast as a teenager and he wound up um, becoming paralyzed from the neck down. And he really believed in like a, a very particular set of exercises that um, if I'd had a license, I probably would have been against or I would, have, I would have forced my education on him and he didn't want that. And so he trained me himself, but, um, but, but for jobs, when you work in people's homes, it's like, it always starts off as like something kind of close to the job description. And then it always moves like somewhere else. So at, at a certain point I was, um, well, I guess this is kind of like illegal at the time anyway, like, like getting some of his weed for him and um, building bongs uh out of like uh plastic bottles and straws mm -hmm. and he like he couldn't have the like pipes or anything like that in the house because he had a teenage stepdaughter who he he didn't want her finding the evidence and so we'd have to like go into the bathroom and like I'd have to put the towel under the door and <laughs> spark him up <laughs> it's like and, you answer um, an ad for physical therapy you end up like breaking bad <laughs> right exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh and yeah so that was I mean that was like among the the jobs uh, I don't know uh, yeah I don't know there was another job where I wound up giving my employer like v v12 shots and I like it had nothing nothing to do with that but somehow it was like you know we're using like needles <laughs> <laughs> less comfortable than like using pipes <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't like heroin it wasn't that those kind of needles but um yeah i don't know weird stuff what do you consider is one of the quintessential things being jamaican and the the one thing that you're most proud of <laughs> quintessential uh <laughs> And things I'm proud of, like being being Jamaican. 
I don't know. Like I was, I was thinking about like stereotypes earlier today. Um, and you know, like sometimes like different ethnicities or, or races will have like the, the ones that are like really meant to insult you. And then there's the ones that are like, you know, like, like, like good at something or, um, like black guy, good at sports, maybe you can jump high or something like that. <laughs> oh. um, and like Jamaicans, um, I don't know if you all ever saw In Living Color with the, the Waynes Brothers TV show. And they had the skit with the Jamaican who he started off as like the pilot. And by the end of the the skit, he's like, uh, he's like serving the drinks. He's like fixing the, the wings. He's the mechanic. He's the pilot. He's the flight attendant. And um I don't know, like doing some of these interviews or, or thinking about the stories I'm writing about, like the way these characters are kind of always on the job. I was just kind of laughing to myself about Jamaicans and then they're, they're having like eight jobs, um, uh, that, that kind of stereotype, like, which I would say like kind of not true, but then kind of, kind of true. Cause I, I know I've had so many jobs and at the <laughs> same time and all that. I, am I proud of it? I don't, it's necessity, I guess. Like, I guess. <laughs> There's a kind of rising to the occasion, possibly. We we go into this um, we go into this book thinking we know what how this how this is all gonna turn out, um. But we were I was mistaken. I was like laughing, crying, and then all the all the feelings, um, because I myself immigrated from the Philippines, and actually the first place that I lived at was Broward County. And I was from Hollywood, Florida. <laughs> um, so as a young adult, I found myself like working in Miami Beach. I was a nurse there in one of the hospitals. Shout out to Mount Sinai. You know, it was Miami was like this messy, but it has its own magic. Um, so that book hit your book hit me with like a wave of nostalgia because I haven't been there for a long time. I left in 2013. Um, so it's very rare for me to have a book and then all the places that you've mentioned, like, oh yeah, I know where Hialeah is. I know where Cutler Ridge is. I know like it changed it to Cutler Bay. Like, you know, and I was showing Veronica like the map of South Florida. Like this is where I used to go and all the things that, you know, I would do. So what is about like you know, South Florida or specifically this one, Miami, that makes it like an imperative background character of your stories? It's the place I I grew up. It's the place I, it's the city and um, region I know best. Um, I left Miami in 2011 and um, I've I've never lived in a city longer than three years, um, except for Miami. Um, and I always thought, you know, I, I thought it was a strange place growing up. I always thought like, this is a really weird place to raise children. And like, I was a child, I was like eight years old, like who, who would raise children here? This is really strange. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I don't know. In, in so many ways, there's just so much like drugs and nudity around, um, and, so much two two live crew on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and I, I thought, you know, I mean, those are stupid little examples, but I, I just thought um, at some point this had to pay me back somehow. And, and mm-hmm. the way that was going to pay me back was it was going to be um, the landscape in which I was going to have these different characters running around and, and trying to survive and, you know, sometimes doing crazy things in order to survive. Um, and, you know, I'm a little bit haunted by Miami. And I think, as you said, like, it does have a, a, a magic. I think I sometimes talk about the, the the downside of living in and being from Miami. But, you know, then I'll go back and it's it's visually stunning, um, mm-hmm. depending on what part of Miami you're in. Or, um, and sometimes I'm like, I have to, you know, I, sh- I should move back so I can take part in it, especially as... Um, I've been, I've become less poor (laughs) and I've, and I've started to think, well, maybe I could actually, you know, enjoy the beauty of Miami without, um, so much of the struggle. And, um, so it's, it's a place that kind of gets under your, your skin. And, Mm -hmm. uh, it's especially a place I, I talk about this in the book where, you know, as you're driving down us one, you might, 
you know, see like so many, you, you will see, you know, a, a hundred Mercedes Benzes, but you'll see like Ferraris going by and test, not Tesla. Um, what was I trying to say? Well, Lamborghinis and, and all this other stuff. And you, you start to think, well, well, they've got it. Like maybe it's my, <laughs> there's like a trajectory that automatically leads you towards having, um, having that kind of wealth. Um, and maybe it's just really like, if you, if you turn left, you'll realize there's a, a rental car agency <laughs> where you can pretend to be rich, just like all those other people who are pretending to be rich, uh, down there. And, um, I don't know, it's, it's a very strange place that is kind of, um, wonderful in ways but also kind of a big trap in other yes. ways yes i'm, I'm curious how like where you thought my book was leading <laughs> that's where that's where my mind is like even my book went somewhere else like where did you oh, think no. it was going? like i actually shared the feeling that miami okay. is a trap like <laughs> pe people think that you know you work there and you're the shit no you mm. become the shit <laughs> like <laughs> it, it's hard living in miami like the old and Veronica asked me like so why did you leave and I'm like well I don't think I had the same answer like I don't think I can raise a child here like why how like I don't I don't know I couldn't wrap my head around it or justify why would I do that to myself and mm -hmm. like there's no reason the only thing that I really miss about it maybe was you know like the food like I can walk down mm -hmm. the street yeah. and I like I can get like whatever whatever like my soul really wants and not like whitewash food you know mm -hmm. like up here in Orlando and like the culture like these music everywhere like people are loud and it's okay but for the most mm -hmm. part I'm with you <laughs> I'm I'm right there <laughs> I'm, I'm riding your car in the back that that's, that's yeah. how I felt. <laughs> it was wild moving away from Miami where uh I, when I first moved away I moved to Minneapolis and people would like choose to get rid of their cars and just take public transportation, especially with their harsh winters. A lot of people didn't want to kind of deal with that. And I just thought for a while, like, Oh, that's wild. Like you're living without a car. Like where does your self-worth come from then? <laughs> Cause Miami, like it's, your yes. self-worth is all about what you're driving. And if you don't have a car at all, like you're, you're just, you know, to a lot of people, you're just worthless. Mm -hmm. um, and so it took me, even me, like I, I knew that was a kind of messed up way to think about the world and to think about people. And that was part of my reason for leaving in the first place, but it still, it took me a while to break out of some of that, um, to, to get some of that out of my system, at least. Yeah, mm -hmm. me too. Like after I left Miami, I stopped buying like ridiculous crap like you know mm. it's it mm -hmm. for other people it might be cars like for other people it might be like bags or shoes or clothes mm -hmm. yeah. like you have to keep up like with that lifestyle I'm like why did I waste all my money on that stupid <laughs> shit you know yep. but you you live and you learn and then after a while you you come to find yourself I'm like yeah this is like I've, I've kind of like lost myself a little bit because it's like it moves really fast and you mm -hmm. wake up and you're like oh how did I get here what happens right, right right <laughs> <laughs> right exactly so your book like we we've said have linkedin stories that follow um this jamaican family living in miami how did you manage to give them like different you know point of views and voices throughout the story like you know dufa's patwa for instance versus like trelawney's and even like his brother uh delano yeah, well, I started with Trelawney and I, I saw him as a character who was going to kind of try on um, these different parts of, a, of of his own identity um, or things like uh, parts of what could be his identity. I guess he's he's kind of grappling with that. And um, I, I guess that's because I, I grapple with some of those questions in terms of um, I I. I go out and I, I talk to like very smart people, people who are, you know, professors, people who um, teach on on race and ethnic studies and all this stuff. And I leave even more confused because like, it seems like none of us can really uh, agree on the, the kind of borders and margins of race and ethnicity and some of this other stuff. But anyway, I wanted to explore a character who was dealing with all of that. And so I thought I would kind of build out his brother um, against him because Chelani is the American born 
member of the family who is is kind of wondering, well, like if I'm coming out of this family of Jamaicans, does that make me Jamaican? But I was also born in the U.S., so am I American? Um, my experience with Miami is that you know, sometimes you, for like multiple generations, you you carry the heritage like of your family very much on your sleeve um, and put that way ahead of your, um, your Americanness, I guess. Um, and so, you know, that was kind of my Trelawney character. And then there's a Delano who's born in Jamaica and he's like, I'm just Jamaican. And he's not actually concerned with any of those questions. Um, and so that was kind of easy for me to have him um, kind of slip in and out of his, Patois, his use of Patois, um, but not necessarily be asking those same questions. He's more interested in um, how to go through the world as a um, a good father, um, or he has a lot of ideas about what it means to to be a man. I think, and um, you know, some some of those ideas I think are are, are interesting and, and worth. Um, unpacking and worth thinking about like how that gets him into some of the trouble that he gets in. Um, And then uh, the father character, Topper, I mean, I I just thought of how he would likely talk to himself in his own language um, since he's kind of telling the story of his life and what led him and and, uh, Sonia to emigrate from Jamaica to the U S and so that's kind of where I came up with the, the, I, didn't, I didn't come up with, but I decided what kind of language he was going to be using as he told his own story. And it just didn't really make sense to me to have him um, telling it to himself in a more um, st- kind of what would be thought of as standard English. Um, and, I, you know, I was also trying to think of like generational attitudes when it comes to mm. Topper versus Chelani, where um topper is more of that generation um that's kind of like you know what you you think you're smart you this next generation thinks they're smart for because they go to college and they know how to you know name every single um problem and have a philosophy for what's wrong with the world but but maybe he has a topper doesn't believe chelani's generation is is good at actually like going out and and fixing things or surviving mm-hmm. or, or just doing the thing that's going to keep you alive and keep you healthy and make you successful. Um, and so uh, just thinking about like their, their different attitudes help me distinguish them, I, I think. And I'm always interested in those questions. I mean, I definitely have my own opinions, but as a writer, I think it's more interesting as a writer of fiction. I think it's more interesting to let the characters kind of voice contradictory opinions that'll make for a more interesting conversation so we can think about like you know what what is the deal right like especially like you know there's there's conflict especially you know when he when he cut that tree that conversation (laughs) Um, and you know because I I feel like me and Trelawney could have been the same age in my head and then you know my dad could have been his dad and like mm-hmm. my dad could have been like, you did not just say that to me. My mom could have been like, can you repeat yourself? <laughs> what did you just say? <laughs> I would have been like slapped, smacked and like be crying in a corner. You know, I, I don't right. know if I could have done what Trelawney did, if I'm being honest. So I'm like, when when that happened, I'm like, hey, hey you did it. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> But I I think that's what is the the charming part about this book in particular is that something that we don't often find in fiction where you have, normally this might be just one or two messy characters, but it just felt like everybody was rolling in their mess and they were wearing it on their sleeve and just standing in it until they maybe eventually, hopefully get to a certain place where they can figure stuff out for them. Um. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to step back to the the very beginning of your book, and your book opens with Trelawney and the main character as the main character of these interlocking stories, um, being asked what race he is, and there are moments um, of being faced with him asking him, you know, the, being this like racially ambiguous child that he winds up in different friend groups, mm-hmm. and he basically hears people 
just feel like you know their their guard is down and they can they can talk and say whatever they want based on their assumption of who Trelawney mm-hmm. is, mm-hmm. and um and so I what I want to do is let's, let's talk about the in between and finding where one can feel like they belong um was how it was one of the central parts of Trelawney and his family's defining of what they wanted to reflect back to the world what did you want to bring to the front with the race question and the self-discovery i i wanted to show these these different moments where we can possibly see that for some people it's not quite so simple to slot themselves into the various boxes that are arriving in the census uh, or, or that we, we kind of talk about, um, uh, as, as though they're one simple, I think we talk about race, like it's this, this kind of simple thing, like everything is a given. Um, but then we also talk about it as though it's like essential, Mm -hmm. um, like, like, like blackness is an essential thing or, um, it's, it's, you know, it's like when, I don't know. I, I talk to a lot of my friends in, in Miami who, uh, what am I trying to say? It's it's like we we act as though like the essential part came before the 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 terms that we then have, even mm-hmm. though like these terms were tend tend to have been like 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 Latinx is is a term that was like created by somebody. And then mm-hmm. you know, and before that, you know, Latino and um and a lot of people before they came to this country like they they weren't going around calling themselves latino it was like oh now you are telling me that i am this kind of thing um for these characters for a character like chelani i just wanted to think about well if if what he looks like gets him into this one group that then is anti-black because they because apparently his presentation isn't enough to tell them that he is a black person um then then that's kind of a that's kind of like a screwy thing or later on in the book um when he takes on the weird job at the chastity characters uh, um, house where she tells a story about her father beating up her sister because he brought a black boy home but it turns out the boy wasn't even black he was south asian and it was like this idea of blackness that he had about the, the the boy and about the situation that that angered him and brought him to you know to to hit his child, um, and I, I guess I'm just kind of like really really interested in these these questions of um, where the where the boundaries are when it comes to our different these different parts of our um, identities, particularly around um, race, I guess. Mm because <laughs> because you know because conversely like the, then there's the moment where he's walking um with his friends and or sorry he's not walking with his friends but he's walking um in high school and it's like the, the the black kids who think he's he thinks he's cool like yeah i've decided i'm black but then some of the black kids are like like oh shit let's get this this latino kid um and and i had like a similar experience in in, in my high school where i was like all right yeah I'm just cool with like we're we're all on the same side and like decisions being made about like oh no like s- some some part of your presentation has now made you on the outs and mm-hmm. um, just thinking about how it can be uh, a little bit slippery for at least for some of us. Yeah, because like with with Trelawney, we see later and you know towards the end of the book, he's in a relationship with a woman who can be seen as this uh, this racist woman that he is dating like she's saying some mm-hmm. really off the wall shit you know that's really it's it's blatant yet subtle in the conversation of like no you can't come over to my parents house and all of these reasons because of his of his race and it shows what he has been willing to barter in order for him to be in relationship with someone and to, I guess, maybe feel like he can find him some security within that space because he's been without security for so long and has been doing all of mm-hmm. these hustles and these grinds. And I think, you know, even when trying to find security within people, you can find the faulty ones that aren't 
as supportive in in the whole self of what you want them to be. So it was really mm -hmm. interesting to read all of these characters, um, like wrestle with what that race is. Also, going back to you know like manhood when you were you know what it means to be a man for Trelawney's brother um and him wrestling with like you know my wife has left me and has taken the kids and mm -hmm. now I'm just trying to mm -hmm. secure this home and get my children back but not really saying okay but what's the real problem like you have no job like how are you going to take care of these children how are you going to do all mm -hmm. of these things and mm -hmm. you know her leaving um and saying like you you are not a provider and what that means for for him of you know like with his own manhood and things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like the mom the mom got away easy. <laughs> like she's like, I'm out. I'll see y'all later. <laughs> 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 I did my time. It's time for me to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I wanted her to have an out. Um you know, and, and she had the dream, you know, in the from the first story of, of traveling a bit. Mm -hmm. And we see she, she kind of gets to do that. Um, she also, you know, I wanted at least one of these characters to, um, it, for a time, like actually try going back to Jamaica and not just mm -hmm. dream about it the way Chelani did and kind of escape America, maybe because I, I fantasize of, about escaping America. Um, but then I, I wanted that also to be kind of realistic about the, the fact that it probably wouldn't be that easy for her to just kind of slide back in and adjust and expect Jamaica, expect the Jamaica that she left or the Jamaica that she grew up in um, to, to be there when she, when she got back. Um, yeah. I mean, there's part of me that probably also let her slide a little bit because I just like, I, I can imagine, um, like abusing my my father and my brother on the page but like when it comes to mom I'm just like I can't do it to like the the the, the mom character who definitely isn't my mom but you know still like modeled a mm -hmm. little bit after my mom and it's just like maybe maybe I maybe I went too easy on her there's definitely a Sonya story I've been working on and it's just like ah uh, like every time I, I go in it's just like ah uh, I can't um Aww. so you know, this is this is that point in the um, my my kind of interview circuit where I just admit like oh, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Maybe, like I maybe. I I love that you know there's there's that dynamic too because it kind of let us like think of like oh what could have she done what did she discover in Jamaica that made her like you know also peace out Jamaica I'm going to Italy you know like there's also mm -hmm. that kind of like wonder that can continue conversations but i understand that feeling cuz like every filipino that goes to the united states they would always say i'm going to retire in the philippines i'm going to buy mm -hmm. a land and build a farm <laughs> and i'm going to retire there like that has always been the narrative and when they go there like for a vacation like you know to scout the place and to see things they're like every time they come back disappointed and I think mm -hmm. they go through that journey again of like remembering why they left. So right. what they end up doing is like they just go like every three to six months then come back to the mm -hmm. United States. You know, like nothing is perfect. I think what you said, you know, whatever the Jamaica or the country that they think that they grew up in, they think they're going to have it again. Mm -hmm. But it's it's mm -hmm. I think it's more painful the second time around. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, people always talk about, you know, being brave when you write these stories and characters that are real and we called it messy because, um, you know, there are issues about colorism, black masculinity, mm -hmm. poverty and racism, like intertwined with these like real stories. But now mm -hmm. that it's all out, it's like, is there any relief for yourself that you've finally spoken these like apparent tr truths or is it more like... <laughs> pressure that people might think oh if jonathan is now our official spokesperson like <laughs> mm -hmm. or like you know go for him for like advice or the real truth um <laughs> well yeah one there is that pressure for sure for sure uh, um there's there's just like a pressure to know and it's like to know everything like to know about black masculinity or um to know 
all of Miami, which I, I don't like. I wrote I wrote about the couple neighborhoods that I lived in, um, and what I kind of experienced there. Or you know, there's pressure to know like the complete history of Jamaica and mm-hmm. and the uh, and the complete like history of colonialism and uh, in in general and the complete history of of like everything having to do with like racism in in america and you know i've done my part to to learn as much as i can um but i'm also just somebody who as much as i learn like i'm not someone who writes I don't retain it in the way that like I can just like read <laughs> I can read all the books but I'm not just gonna go give like a TED talk on it yes I, I became a writer because that's my best mode of communication mm-hmm. and that's how I bring in all of this um I guess this like information via lived experience and research um and uh try to make the clearest picture possible via the the stories I tell and then put it in the prose um and I think there's part of me that is very happy to have been able to you know I guess like tell my my version of the truth you know my truth as they say but um you know the flip side of that is that when you write the whole book and you publish it and it's getting out you know somewhat widely every time somebody misunderstands what you read, <laughs> it just breaks your heart, you know, mm-hmm. or, or every time someone's like, I know exactly what you mean. And then they repeat back to you something kind of wild or um, I was on a panel the other day and um, I, I thought it was a good panel. The moderator was asking really smart questions. And then she, she ran up to me immediately after. And she said, I, I have to ask, and anytime someone runs up to you and says, I have to ask, that's a sign that you should just get up and, and walk away <laughs> because whatever they're about to ask is going to be offensive or it's just going to be crazy. And she was like, can you do the accent? Do the accent. And oh, I was like, what? No. <laughs> and she was like, no, I, she was like, no, I lived. She didn't say she lived in Jamaica, but she was like, I lived in, you know, fill in the blank Caribbean island. And after like six months, I could do the accent. I had it down. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, like. Because I'm not going to, I don't know, like, I'm not really going to engage in that conversation. Like, no, after six months, you did not have the accent down. There's, <laughs> oh, my God. It is literally impossible. Um, and so, you know, and that's the type of thing where it's like, wow, you, 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 you claim you read my whole book. You actually asked good questions that seem to suggest that you read my whole book. And then, like, that's the first thing you do. Um <laughs> like she might as well have walked up to me and said what are you um and <laughs> and and so that's the disheartening thing it's like yeah. wow you spent all these years writing a book trying to get your point across or your points across or just your experience across and um and sometimes there's sometimes the gulf is just too wide and it's it's just not getting across which you know that's a bit of a downer yeah that's that's definitely disheartening when you have a conversation like that because it's one they want you to perform and you yep. want to be like, no, I'm not, I'm not, you know, here for a show. Like I came to right, talk about right. my book and, right. and having to deal with that, which is very unfortunate, which then leads me to my next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing that I have pulled from the conversations that we've had with other authors on our podcast, such as Mateo Escarapur and Morgan Totley and um, Elaine Shea Chow who've written these books that really deal with race in a in a very you know specific manner um is that people have this desire uh to want to make the author admit that yes this whole book is ripped from the headlines that is my life has there been any difficulty in having to make this very clear distinction with readers that what you all are reading is is fiction yeah that's 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 been tough um i don't i don't know like where i get kind of stuck on it is you know what's the intention behind the either like the assumption that it's all directly out of my life um like does that make it if it if it if it were true that all of this 
you know, it's basically memoir. And for some reason, I decided to call it fiction. Like, I don't know, for maybe, maybe they believe that that's a marketing strategy I have. Um, still, like, would that make it more or less valuable or, or artistic right. to them? Like, I'm, there always seems to be like a point that they're trying to get to. And I'm never quite sure what exactly the the point is. I mean, something I get asked a lot is if I showed up for some of those weird Craigslist jobs mm. and there's this like real excitement and <laughs> well, before I answer the question and I, you know, I, I tend to tell the truth, which is no, um, of the, of the two weirder Craigslist jobs that Jelani finds. Um, I, I did, I did see very similar job postings, but I did not literally go and show up for the jobs and do the things that Jelani does. And, um, I don't, there's like, I, I I almost want there to be an alternate universe where I just say, yes, yes, I did all that. All of that happened just to see like, what, what would happen? Like, would people like the book more somehow? Would they, or would they hate me more? Cause they're like, you're, you're a screwed up dude um, for having done that. Or, or what would they, what would they think? I, I don't know where it's, I don't know where it's all going. <laughs> I don't know what the intention is. Um, is it just like strange curiosity that, that, um, leads to that question. Um, I, the intention I, I is that know. people are essentially nosy and they want to know your business, it, be it if it was mm. good or bad. They they just want to know, like, was it real? Like, did you really do that? Was it real? I, I think was that's just, real? you know, people want gossip. So, yeah. I guess, but then it's like, well, I don't know. Like, at what point are we expecting fiction writers to use their imagination or at least allowing them to use their mm -hmm. imagination like sometimes when, I, when i'm asked that question like is did it all happen and i say absolutely it all happened that point in the book where i get left and abandoned by my father in the middle of the ocean and i die <laughs> <laughs> that, that part happened and i'm actually i am actually here talking to you from beyond the grave <laughs> um, I'm also and, Jesus. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, and yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do with all of that. And it's, it's kind of weird when, um, I mean, sometimes people are like, are you tired of getting asked that question? I'm like, yeah, kind of. Um, but sometimes people are just kind of brazen enough to say like, let's break it down. Let's go, <laughs> let's go story by story. And it's like, do we really have to do that? Like, I don't think. <laughs> this is where I say pineapple. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and where I say the safe word. <laughs> and now I understand earlier when you're like pineapple, why in what context? Because then now I understand, like, I guess because you know, you presented this story that you know it's not always in pages, and people are like, So let's discover more, you know. It mm -hmm. it, it seems like what it hit me the most is like, you know, when you said, Is it real? and it's like, If it's real or not, would it invalidate whatever you wrote in the book? And that. Right that really hurt my feelings i think because i'm like mm -hmm. it shouldn't like it shouldn't matter whether it was all made up or if it's all true like mm -hmm. what the heck you care about like it's yeah. just it was just playing playing in my head yeah i mean i think the one place i i just as a decision on what would be kind of ethical in terms of talking about race is that um you know, like there's, there's hardly a line of dialogue that is um, like a racially insensitive thing that, that, that somebody didn't either say to me or around me, say in my presence. Usually it's the kind of things that were said over and over and over again to the point where it's burned in my brain so that I remember it well enough to put it into fiction. Um, and the reason I say like that was important to me because I, I don't want to especially in the case where it's like, it's not just, it's not just like weird conversations that are happening between white characters and black characters. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's all these different um, like people of color characters, characters yeah. of color, if you will, um, who are, who are having like strange interactions as well. And that's the kind of thing where it's like, well, I'm not trying to like stoke and create tension in, but you know, between um, groups of people at all. Um, but at the same time, when you start to hear these things like over and over and over, it's like, well, this seems to be this seems to be part of our culture and something that we 
you know, I mean, a collective culture and, and something that we maybe um, could take a closer look at, you know, um, and and see if we can't do better, I guess, or or, or just kind of put our finger on like, well, what, what is that uh, thing all about? Yeah, but, uh, you know, like living in Miami, I didn't really see a lot of white people, if I'm being honest. It's more mm -hmm. like, to me, like the Miami that I saw is more, more, you know, more brown than white. So, mm -hmm. like, I understand when you were saying, like, you know, like, we we sometimes are against each other, especially like, oh, you know, even like, you know, oh, they're they're this type of like, they're from this country, like, you know, just South America alone is huge. And even then they have like disparities in between themselves. So right. that I completely understand. I'm like, you know, even Fili Filipinos would look like, oh, no, don't don't associate with them like. They're, they're not from the same region that we're from. It mm -hmm. happens everywhere. And it's this. Right, region. exactly. Because it's like, right, we just right. all band together. We can win. <laughs> but that's a whole other <laughs> podcast. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, talking about people of color and immigrants, we always want to claim something as our own. It might stem from mm -hmm. being displaced or seemingly not having enough resources readily available for us you know, to use, like, that whatever hard work we do, it's always seen that, you know, we are always a step or two behind. Um, We saw it in every person in Trelawney's family. Was that an intentional theme that um, you, you have, you know, you made, like, the reader feel kind of, like, heavy? And, you know, the heaviness of the struggle of how it is really to be othered in, like, the United States? Yeah, um... Well, I, I want to make sure I I understand your your question in, in terms of um, the heaviness that that each of them are feeling in terms of being othered or because um, yeah. for me I, like I, what I was thinking about is having the weight of um, having emigrated to the U.S. Mm -hmm. and struggling to survive. Um, kind of breaking this family apart mm -hmm. and and a lot of what they're going through you know i think i think you know delano for example the older brother who's concerned with getting his kids back and he he has this kind of you know terrible slap together plan of how he's going to get his business back on track and how that's going to kind of solve all his problems and he's going to be able to get his kids back in his life um you know like if he if he came from a a family where like generational wealth that put him in a position where he wasn't going to be, um, you know, just broke and unable to right. provide, um, you know, I don't think he would have to necessarily, I don't know, get himself in, in that position in the first place. Like, I don't think he would have to examine um, some of those questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, I think I'm always interested in like, what are the conditions for having a, a healthy family or a family that kind of survives across generations or what's the, what are the conditions for love to sustain or be sustained? Um, if we, if, if the literal struggle to survive is kind of consuming us, um, you know, how does that kind of eat us from the inside out and destroy a lot of our, our relationships? And, and, you know, I think that's kind of the, those are some of the questions I, I was thinking about. Um, I think though for Trelawney, he has a, a particular kind of struggle where, you know, he, in, in his viewpoint, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking of the sentence, but he's like resentful of, in a way, his, his brother and his mother, um, because he, he says something like, you know, how nice to imagine that you have a homeland to escape to, mm -hmm. um, where he feels like the the country he was born in is is not welcoming to him at all. Um, and he doesn't have that same, you know, even if it's an imagined Jamaica, he still doesn't even have ownership over that imagined Jamaica that he could escape to. Um, and his, I don't think his parents really set him up to feel like, that Jamaican heritage was really like his to claim. Mm -hmm. um, and so that leaves him kind of cast out of even his own family unit from a, from an early age. Um, and, and so that sets up, I, I think a particular set of struggles of um, living in this kind of nebulous 
in between place. Um, and, you know, so I, I think he's got a, a kind of uh, singular struggle within his family. Um, but I think a lot of people kind of deal with similar similar questions, especially the, the, the generation after the, the one that actually uh, emigrates. Um, but, you know, the, he, he, uh, the, conversely, he doesn't understand his, the struggle that his parents went through and like how difficult it would have been to make um, a decision to, to leave your home country and rebuild in a new country. And, um, you know, in ways I, I, I think, I wonder if like that's a big part of why Miami is the way it is. And that's why we try to have flashy things to kind of prove that we have rebuilt and that, you know, our, our, our decisions to have left um, and rebuild in the U.S. and rebuild in Miami, like that, that it was a good move and that we, we made it. Um, uh, that could be total BS, but, but, you know, just, it's such a like glitzy, glammy city. It's like, why do we do that? And it's like, I wonder, you know, I wonder if there's this, if we follow the trail back, it's just like the, the far end of the immigrant struggle and, trying to um uh justify it i guess i understand a justification because it's the same i've seen it like in groups of people that i'm surrounded with especially if i can just only speak for filipinos like if somebody like you know we're all nurses and then somebody remodels their kitchen next week somebody would be coming oh yeah i'm having some remodeling in my bedroom and it's kind of just <laughs> this like competition among among themselves I'm like that's is so unnecessary but I think it's their way of telling each other and maybe also themselves that I've made it like I'm not struggling like the rest of them the rest yeah. of them i.e me <laughs> and, <laughs> right you know like you know Denny's not having like I you know I, we're living in like a little tiny apartment and then I'm having like my bathroom redecorated, you know? So it's kind <laughs> of like that separation of like, I've, I've, I've finished like fulfilling like the need to eat, like a roof over my right. head. So right, now right, I right. have to prove to you that I, I am right here right now, you know? <laughs> and that struggle, like that poverty um, is not something that I think a lot of people really understand about this place. Because, you know, we have this thing called like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like you can't move on to like another set of your, like the needs cannot be fulfilled on the higher part of the triangle. Like if you, if you can't eat, like it's Im officially right. impossible, but right. we, we try to pretend by giving ourselves more problems just so we can, the world can think that we've made it. Yeah. Yeah. This this book definitely could be used in a in psychology class and and talking about those needs. But then you have people who might not even have the money to make oh, those yeah. things happen, but pretend like they can make them happen and find themselves deeper in debt. But again, that's another podcast. Um, so we have <laughs> we should pitch questions. that though. <laughs> <laughs> Necessary reading. <laughs> it's like the part is everywhere. Uh, uh, two questions Sorry. left in in our conversation, and um, so. It has been a very long time since I could say that the last sentence I read in a book was just as good as the one that your title story gave. I was I was listening to it and I was it just felt like I took a breath. It was just so good. Um, and it gave me this feeling that the title, uh, If I Survive You, and that last sentence went hand in hand. It wasn't just implying that Trelawney was making an attempt at surviving his parents, brother, or even this multi-universe that is racism, but also trying to survive himself and the repercussions of his choices. Is that a correct assumption? Yes, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because I, when I was when I was reading that particular part of the book it just felt like a full circle moment and even though I know that this is a short story collection it's so easy even with those that have been linked because we've read linked ones before and they just felt so loose like they just were disjointed mm -hmm. but this one was the first time where it really felt like everything made sense with every single story and 
it really just came to that last sentence that was when you wrote that particular story was that the first of your whole collection and that's why it's titled the way that it is or is this just one that was in between that you were like okay i'm gonna base this whole book off of i that, i wrote that story last actually and but i did I, <laughs> I i had the title at a certain point i was living in um boston boston area uh somerville specifically and i was i remember the coffee shop i was in and i was with two writer friends and we were working and at some point I realized my working title was really bothering me. Um, and I had that, that word survive, like kept popping up in stories. Um, and I kept telling stories in the second person. Um, and I kind of just realized like, since I was talking about this, um, these father son dynamics in particular, that that might be, uh, you know, thinking about like surviving your parents in, in any um, interpretation of what that might mean, like when your parent dies and you survive them or when your parent is like li doing harmful things that might literally kill you. Um, so that's where I like I came up with the title, but uh, I was definitely thinking about Trelawney and his decisions and especially towards the end, once he's back living in a house and he has a probably low paying job, but still a job. Um, he, he doesn't have to try to buy the house and he doesn't have to show up for this crazy job that he finds on Craigslist. And he's just kind of like replicating bad decisions, you know, over and over. And it, it, it did become um, apparent to me at some point in the writing of, I don't know if it was that story before or before writing that story that, it was it is his bad decisions that that he really needs to um survive but when i wrote that story i mean it, it, i wrote it last i knew i wanted to you know the stories have been linked already but i knew i wanted to kind of close out a lot of threads that had appeared before um and it, it took a lot of planning and you know um etching out like exactly what each story was doing and um, what characters were appearing in each of the stories and like what uh, an arc for each of these characters might look like. Um, where, do, where do we meet them in the beginning versus the ending? Um, how are they changing? How is Chalani in particular? How is his relationship with each of his family members changing? And so there was a lot of uh, planning around that story and how it was going to close out the whole book. Yeah. And, and I, I think I, you know, I think I had a sense that since I had the title and I liked the title <laughs> that I was going to name that story. If I, if I survive you um, and then kind of work towards earning that uh, being the title story. So that's. Did anybody that's ever fight with you about that? No, no, no. Oh, that's um, good. Yeah, you know, last minute, I, I even got like cold feet on the title when I was talking to my agent right before we went, we went out on submission to sell the book and I had another title in mind. Um, and she was like, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> not, that, not that she had like the final decision on it or anything, but, you know, she then came up with a, a good argument to kind of convince me back into the thing. I think what happens is when you work on a book for so long, it's just like, at a certain point, you start changing things just to change them, to make them feel new and fresh to you because you've been sitting with it for years and years. And um, I'm really, really glad uh, I, I stuck with that, um, that If I Survive You title. And we are. And too. yeah, no, all the publishers really who who wanted to publish it, they all loved it. And <laughs> no one no one said anything uh, about changing it. And and I and I heard they they do tend to if they feel otherwise. Well, we have come to the part of our conversation, the last question that we ask every guest that comes on the show. Uh, we would like to know what are your top five favorite books of all time, if that's too much for you, the top five that you are most excited about, or you can give us a mix. Pop quiz. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, how fast do you want me to go through this? <laughs> through we can books. edit, so take your time. Mm -hmm. Like You're not in a um, hurry. Uh, Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. 
um, because it's funny as hell, but it's also like really empathetic. Um, it plays with time in a way that always it, it, it it's hard for me to remember exactly how the book is going to play out, especially because Vonnegut was an author who believed in telling you exactly like this is everything that's going to happen in the book. And he tells you, you know, from fr the, from the first page, and then you go through this wild ride of, of um, seeing how all of that actually plays out. And um, I, I think there's something really magical about that. Uh, Percival Everett, his um, I am not Sydney Poitier is a, uh, probably the funniest book I've ever read. And um, it's also about, it's a kind of Bildungsroman of, um, you know, growing up, coming of age, but um, deals with, you know, race and um, black boyhood, black masculinity in a, a really interesting way. Um, Noah Larson's uh, Quicksand, mm -hmm. which is a, a little bit, bleaker of an ending um well i don't know people always say that some people say my ending is bleak and i, I think the ending of my book is like oh. super helpful <laughs> um and i, I think it depends oh, what kind God. of life you <laughs> sorry what were you saying it was so good like those people are crazy no it Thank was you. so good it was so good because you know like at some point you got you gotta figure things out for yourself as a reader like you gotta have an interaction with the book you got to talk, mm -hmm. you got to talk to it. You got to talk to yourself, to other people yeah. about it. I think that's what makes a good book. Because if you have all the question and it's just all kind of like, you know, it's not bleak there. I think there is, there is so much hope for all those characters or maybe Thank it's just the optimist in us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I appreciate it. I, I think it's like your starting point because some, some people are like, whoa, these characters go through some things. And I'm like, but that's what that's life. Like don't we all go through some things yeah. maybe maybe not all of us go through some things maybe i don't i don't, I don't, know. I don't know must be nice how could they even must say nice. that after the last three years we've just lived through like no, yeah they're still no. saying it but I, good question good question yeah. that's what i'm gonna say next time though i'm just gonna say must be nice <laughs> yeah because it's like everybody goes through like some sort of like difficulty in their life other people might magnify it other people might think it's a short you know containment of what they have had done in like all these years but yeah mm -hmm. everybody goes through shit it's just yeah. different shits yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so Nella larson's quicksand just it's it's like the the way um i haven't read it for a few years so um but the my i don't think i could have written my book without having read that book and just it, she wrote so bravely about race and about like the nuances of race, um, especially her herself being a biracial um, author writing about a bi biracial character. Um, and I say biracial, I mean black and white. Um, uh, God, I was thinking of. Um, it's so hard. I, I've got three down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, there's like <laughs> um, their eyes are watching God. I mean, that's, that's such a phenomenal. I mean, again, there's the part where in their eyes are watching God, where um, I think what uh, the character is named Janie, mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, when she is at the the store that her and her husband own, and they're 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 doing the dozens, and it's like if the scene is so funny, but then the narrator is also like breaking down like black humor and why it's funny and why it works and how it works. And um, it's just freaking phenomenal. Um, and I mean, but, that's just like one, one small part of the book. Yeah. <laughs> is there anything that you, you know, I think one of the, the cool things about being a writer in your book coming out is that you get free books from other people mm -hmm. they want you to know is has have you had a chance to read anything yet that you're like oh this is this is pretty good i just read taylor cook cooks thrillville usa mm -hmm. and it's coming out in march it's a story collection and um that one it blew me away in terms of um 
like the like really powerful surprising pros i'm a big i'm a big dennis johnson fan so like a nomination for the fifth spot is jesus's son and um this one kind of reminded me of jesus's son with like these weird down and out characters i love down and out characters for for one thing um and they're they're just kind of trying to get through life and survive but it felt you know very much um it felt like 2020, I was going to say 2022, but like 2023, <laughs> now that we're in 2023, it feels, like, it feels like 2023. It feels like now it's, it's, it's very, um, it, it feels like a, a, a right now book um, in a good way, not, not in a fad way, but like in a, it's, it's updated in a way that's like um, good for readers to, <laughs> today. Uh, yeah, that's, that's probably one of my favorite um, advanced copies that I've received um yeah yeah i well, think i leave it there <laughs> mm-hmm. jonathan thank you so much for for joining us in conversation i know you know we are on both on opposite ends of the country but it has been a pleasure to be able to speak with you i know you've been very busy um it's not every day that everyone gets to talk to terry gross and all all the other people in the world so (laughs) congratulations on all of the awards and all of the acknowledgement and conversations you have about if i survive you and uh we we really appreciate you again coming on the show oh thank you so so much for having me and um uh, all the best to you back back over there in florida (laughs) yes while we burn watch us burn (laughs) Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, we hope we hope you have a good night, and thank you for joining us in the podcast. All right. Good night. Bye. We hope you enjoyed our show. Make sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the Vulgar Geniuses. Our theme song that you're not in your head along to was produced by Sean Kantrowitz. You can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Dammit. That's S-E-A-N-D-A-M-M-I-T. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our podcast. See you soon. Deuces. Deuces.